Greetings, podcast powerhouses. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, your headquarters for the most mischievous discussions of the latest episode of Marvel Television. And that means it's time to complete our exploration of the apocalyptic third episode of Loki and start looking ahead to the second half of the series. You know what we do here at the Marvelous TV Club? We organize our discussions into three separate shows with three distinct lenses. That allows us to have focused discussions and hopefully makes it easier for you, the listener, to retain stuff. Thursday's StoryCast is where we discuss the episode's themes and we discussed its subversive testing of the boundaries of romance as well as a running theme of the best laid plans going kablooey. Saturday's Ponder Vision is where we ponder the episode's most captivating conundrums. And this week, Jesse and I explored everything from the symbology of Loki's and Sylvie's horns to some wild possibilities for who might be at the top of that golden elevator ride. But now it's time for us to complete our analysis of this third episode with Character Cast. This is where we evaluate the characters themselves, their motivations, their reasonings, their strengths, their faults, their arcs, all of that. I'm your multi hyphenate host, producer, editor, social media maven, and more, Mark Folletti. And as always on Character Cast, I'm joined by an actual defender of freedom from our reality who hopefully can protect us from planets that will collapse onto us, Christine Kippins. No pressure. I was about to say, um, that sounds like pressure, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to put <laughs> on I, you. I did watch Armageddon, though, so I should be fine, right? Yeah, I think you have all the plans you need. And hey, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. to add extra pressure to it, this is my first ever Marvelous TV Club birthday show. This is my birthday. When you hear this episode, you'll be hearing it on the Monday. That is my birthday. Mark. Mark, you have no idea how much this delights me because during our, well, maybe after our recording today, I wanted to ask you when your birthday was because I don't think I had it in my calendar. And you and I had a personal exchange yesterday that made me think like, I need to know what Mark's sign is because I think he might be a cancer. And then lo and behold... Yep. You're a cancer, I Mark. Am. This is why I love you so much. Uh, I love I my cancer. I don't know why being a cancer does that for me, other than, you know, apparently it makes me a bit of a hot mess in, in late June. <laughs> I don't really know. I mean, what? <laughs> You're a little sensey right now. I feel like, but but all of us get to be sensey with you because it's your season. Okay. So, okay. yeah. I like that. I like my sensey people. Yeah, no, that's definitely, definitely... Uh, where I'm at and, you know, uh, just maybe Loki's making me fragile. Maybe work's making me fragile. Who, who can say, but, uh, I, what I don't feel fragile about is our table of contents. We have an awesome run of show, uh, for our character cast today. So we're going to spend some time comparing and contrasting Loki and Sylvie because their similarities and their differences, I think could reveal a lot about the show's view on whether and how Loki and any of us can change. And then we're going to talk about each of them separately for a bit and then touch on maybe a couple of personnel issues over at the TVA. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let's get started with our our doomed duo, Christine. I'm so excited. This is going to be a good a good episode. Yeah. Well, I mean, as opposed to all those other bad ones. No, fuck that. We make great shows here at Character Cast. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. I'm just kidding. Uh, look, I want to start with the main ways that Loki and Sylvie differ, especially personality wise. What jumps out at you as the differences between these two? Well, I have a long list. So should we go back and forth on this one? Yes, because my list is pretty long as well. So let's do that. <laughs> okay, good. I wouldn't be surprised if we had a lot of the same things, but I'm going to note something that probably isn't on your list. And it might seem, I don't know, a little dumb to note this. But there's there's a difference that I noticed straight away when I first saw this episode. And anytime I rewatch it, it's just something that my eye is drawn to all the time and I note. And it's when Sylvie walks through the time portal into the TVA the first thing she does to signal that she's ready for battle is that she puts her hair in a half pony. <laughs> she gets her hair out of her face. And I don't know if it's just like a girly thing to do. I don't think it is because like we've seen Thor with his hair pulled back. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's an Asgardian thing to do to have these beautiful braids. And I mean, Thor's beard was beautifully braided during Endgame and whatnot. So having your hair out all the time isn't necessarily like an Asgardian thing, right? Like they do other things with their hair. 
But Loki is constantly flipping his hair back. He's always about style over, like, function, I guess. And Sylvie's about business. That's you right. know what I mean? Like, she talks about, you know, being hedonistic, but she's not going to put that above the mission. She's super focused on just that. She doesn't care about the style component. When some guy grabs her cape, she, like, uses it as a weapon to, like, you know, get him off of her and then just leaves it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, she doesn't care to, like, pick it up and throw it over her arm or whatever. Her cape's gone now. <laughs> so I feel like Loki would be like, oh, my God, my cape. You know what I mean? He's so much more of a dandy than she is. And, uh, yeah, it's just that in that one moment, I was just like, oh, my girl is about business. I really like her. And it shows you the difference when you have a woman directing action sometimes because you get things like thinking about what the hell you're going to do to get your hair right. out of your face as opposed to, the, you know, the Zack Snyder or whatever who just wants to, like, show it whipping in the wind in these sort of artificial ways. So, I don't know. I really like that as a distinction point. It was one of my favorite little physical acting moments of the show. And I guess the way I thought about this difference was, too, that she's very purpose-driven, she mm -hmm. wants to complete her mission. She's focused on this one thing, and she has been focused on this one thing for who knows how long. Meanwhile, Loki is out here fishing for a new sense of purpose every two weeks and right. usually is casting about for some sort of way to either make himself feel better or put himself in a better position. But he's not really about a purpose and is constantly, I think at odds with her notion of this. He's just sort of like, well, why wouldn't we just like, I don't know, party right now and forget about everything for a little bit. And she's like, because of mission, because of business, as you're saying. So I like that as a difference. What else you got? Um, I think Sylvie is pretty rough around the edges. Whereas Loki is, I hate to say this, but he's refined. Mm. You know, like Loki clearly grew up at a royal court and Sylvie did not, right? Like, if you just look at the way they insult each other or react to insults, you know, like, Sylvie, Sylvie says, you look like someone with a shit plan. She told him to piss off. She told him, don't be an ass. And she straight up called him an asshole <laughs> when he broke the, um, when he broke the temp pad. And when she insults him, Loki's reaction is just like, oh, rude. Oh, how droll. You know, and, and I think a big thing is also when he says, you know, he's never walked so far in his life. And she said, that's a pretty good life. So she's clearly had to walk very long distances before, which is not something a royal child would have had to do at any point in time. So I think Sylvie has indicated several times over the episode that the way she grew up was very different from the way that Loki grew up and it was a bit a bit edgier. She definitely doesn't seem to be interested in those things. I hadn't really thought about the the difference in the way that they respond to insults. I think that's such a great characterization to notice. But the other thing that I think her reaction to those insults reveals is that Sylvie is hard on the sleeve, right? Mm -hmm. When she's mad at Loki, it's like my second favorite moment behind the hair tie was just the like, ah, and boom, yeah. just a little, a pointless explosion of energy, which she probably needed to conserve given how tired she already was, but was just mad, right? When Sy Sylvia has contempt for you, you know it. When Sylvia is in her feels for a moment, like she was inside the train, you know mm -hmm. it. She is who she shows you, and Loki is obviously the opposite. Most people spend most of their time with Loki wondering if you can trust any of the feelings that he is showing you. Thor is always kind of hoping you can trust this guy and usually being disappointed. And Mobius, I think, is in much the same boat. Everybody is skeptical that Loki is showing you anything, and I think even Loki is. He probably gets too much shit for this. I think he often feels what he is showing you in the moment. He's just willing to go the other way at the drop of a hat, which is still very different than Sylvie. Yeah, I think so. But I think there are still hints of that with Sylvie because I actually think of her as a bit more reserved, right? And I think this goes into one of the other differences that I have for the two of them is that, you know, Loki's the talker. 
and Sylvie not so much, right? But because of that, you know, when they're walking to the Ark, Loki says something along the lines of, you know, I feel like I've been sharing a lot here. And I don't know (laughs) a lot about you. And she says, you know, thanks for the tactical advantage, right? So she's well aware that she's not, she hasn't been answering like any of his questions at all until that moment where she decides to be like, okay, well, let me tell you how my enchantment works. Another moment for me that I thought was rather telling was on the train when Loki is showing off his little fireworks display in his hand that Frigga taught him. And Sophie smiles immediately. And then as soon as she smiles, she brings it back. She tries to put on a straight face and then, you know, she sniffs and acts as though she's not impressed. She's like, not bad or whatever, you know? So I thought that moment was, was pretty telling in that Sophie clearly has feelings like she's, she finds delight in this show of magic, but she doesn't want to show that to Loki. Not True, yet, but she's just bad at, at hiding it, in my opinion. Like, I agree that she wants <laughs> yeah. to hide it. I just don't right. think she can. Fair enough, fair enough. That's a good point. You know, I also think she's a punch first person, which Loki is making fun of her for the entire episode, which also Correct. fits hard on a sleeve for me. She's just mad and she wants to hit someone. So that's what she wants to do. Whereas Loki, you know... He stabbed people in the back like 50 times. He never (laughs) wants a face-to-face showdown, whereas that's all she craves. Yeah, no, I definitely had that as uh, Sylvia's fight first, talk later (laughs) (laughs) kind of person. You know, much quicker to pick up a sword than to bargain. You know, we saw that with her fighting Loki at the TVA. Uh, as soon as they get to Lamenta, she still wants to fight. The homestead lady is a great example of that for just like kicking the door down and getting shot in the chest where Loki's like, how about we like assess the situation a little bit, you know? Um, it, it was also like a little reminiscent of Sam and Bucky at the warehouse okay. back at uh, back in Falcon and Winter Soldier a million and one years ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I totally, I totally am on the same page with you on that. She's very much a fight first, talk later kind of gal, which, you know, I can appreciate. Yeah, I also appreciate it. You know where you stand with her, which is mm-hmm. a pretty wonderful thing. Whereas with Loki, I think you're always searching for it. You know, he loves manipulating people too. I think that's something he enjoys, even for harmless reasons, not not always because he's just trying to get over on you, but just enjoys the process of making you feel the thing he wants you to feel or think the thing he wants you to think. I think she's just more focused on winning and domination and getting her way. She's not great at it because she doesn't have great manipulation skills. But I do think that their end goals when they're interacting with each other are slightly different in that way. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Those are some of the things I see. Did your list get longer than mine? Do you have more? Well, one thing I have is that Loki looks for alliances, whereas Sylvie is very comfortable going it alone, probably because she's had to her whole life. But, you know, with Loki, he was he teamed up with the Frost Giants in the first Thor movie. He teamed up with the other in the Chitaurian Avengers even at Ragnarok, he was ready to team up with the Grand Master and getting good with him. Like, he's always looking for somebody to get in good with in order to advance his goals or whatever. And I think Sylvie is just like, no, I, I can't rely on anyone but myself. So I just have to do everything alone. Well, given who Loki winds up working with, those are all shit alliances, right? <laughs> the Grand Master <laughs> yeah. is an asshole. The Tatari suck. The Frost Giants have no love for Loki, despite him being one of them. So I feel like he's got a bad boyfriend complex, whereas Sylvie's just permanently single. I mean, but look at the amazing team up at the end of the Dark World with him and his brother. Good point. That was a great team up. That's a great point. And even by the end of Ragnarok, he's definitely shown he can figure this shit out. But let's not obsess exclusively about their differences, Christine. What are some of the main ways you see Loki and Sylvie as similar? So this list is considerably shorter <laughs> Amen. <laughs> than the other one. So the first thing that I listed just played out their liars because <laughs> Sophie can damn well sleep on a train. She comes in, she tells Loki, she's like, listen, I, I can't sleep on trains. I need 
to have, I can't have my back to the door. And he's like, but wait a second, we've got two doors here. Right. Anywhere you sit, you're going to have your back to a door. And then five minutes later, she's fast asleep on the <laughs> exactly. train. And I'm just like, listen, lady, I know you're trying to play hard in front of him and try to get your way no matter what, but like, <laughs> you're a bad liar. What the hell? You're right, because they're the difference is they're good. One is good at it, one is bad at it. But the key point is they are both always trying to feed you some shit. Yeah, good point. Also, thinking about something we noticed as a difference between them was it also I think comes out here as a similarity when you dig down deep, which is I actually think they're both pretty hardened against really truly trusting people because they talk about mm-hmm. trust between each other a lot. And or maybe a better way to think about it is being truly vulnerable with someone. I think they both hate that idea of giving somebody something that they could use against you, uh, whether it's a feeling or a piece of your backstory or how your magic works or the tempad or anything that puts you in a vulnerable position. They both hate the shit out of that. Mm -hmm. But I also think they kind of want it more than anything, which is also interesting and partly comes out in that nostalgia they each have for their mothers, which may or may not be both talking about Frigga because, as you noted, the tight-lipped Sylvie didn't tell us too much about her mom. But they do want that vulnerability at some level. So that was kind of the other little detail I had between them. Do you have anything else on your list? No, I I definitely noted that they they both have a longing for their mother. Like there's there's some good feelings wrapped up in there. The only other thing that I noticed as a similarity were their fighting styles, right? Like I loved the moment at the end when the arc is about to explode where they both square up. Like they both have the same body language hmm. before they start charging down that main avenue to get to the arc. And I absolutely loved it. And of course, they both prefer blades over <laughs> anything else, which I think is also a lovely little connection. But of course, Loki has his two smaller blades and she has her big longer one. But, you know, she could have picked up an axe. I also love that because his blade is about stabbing you in the back, whereas hers is, I want to watch your face as I stick this in your belly. Like she wants to gut her enemy, whereas he wants to get him in the back. So that's, but that detail around blade work, the intimacy of the kill is the shared detail. They just have, again, slightly different interpretations, variations, if you will, on the idea of stabbing (laughs) people. How do you think they are going to get out of this mess, Christine? I mean, will they? Oh. What if, what if? It's a four episode show instead of a six episode no. show. No. We just watch the well, asteroids come. What if the rest of the show is just Mobius trying to clip all the new Loki Sylvie created when she bombed the timeline? <laughs> like, what if, what if, like, you know, we had a Mobius list episode? This episode, what if the fourth one is like Mobius doing that and then finally like somewhere around five or six, it's just the end for these two. I mean, it would be so depressing and so not satisfying. <laughs> like, I was just like, what if? What if they don't get off this fucking planet? But I'd like to think that Loki's boyfriend is going to come and rescue them. Yeah. You know, he knows that. That Sylvie is hiding in apocalypses. He just has to go to all of them. And thankfully with the TVA, like time doesn't really matter, right? So they can show up right before the end and nab them. Um, I mean, my thing is, why nab them? At this point, I would just clip them. You know, I would just (laughs) eradicate both of them. But even though I think, you know, I would hope that it's Mobius coming to get them, I'm nervous it might be Renslayer Ooh. because because Renslayer knew like the the timeline was bombed. She saw that she grabbed her glow stick, as you and Jesse call them, and there's there's nothing else I'm calling them but glow sticks from here on out. They are glow sticks. She grabbed her glow stick and went straight to the timekeeper's elevator. Like she knew what Sylvie was up to, so. I have a feeling that Renslayer now is like, fuck Mobius, I'm taking this on myself, and I'm bringing these two in. Renslayer getting you would be much worse for the two of them than (laughs) Mobius. The ever-forgiving, ever-patient Mobius would be a blessing in disguise compared to Renslayer, who might 
have even seen this before. I wonder if, to your mm. point about her going right to that hallway, when grabbing her stick as though, here we go again, if she's even seen a Loki or two do this. The only other person I would put on the list of who might help them get out of this, our deus ex machina, would be a deus ex Loki. Some other Loki who comes, finds them, and gives them a second shot. How does that happen? Well, if there are hundreds or thousands of these Loki variants running around, maybe we just need one other of those, maybe the Tour de France guy, to grab another Tempad and run around. How would he know about them or they know Mm. about them or she know about them? I don't know. That's the problem. Why would you go find these two random particular Lokis and do anything about it? Unless you were looking for two more people to fill out your Loki timekeeper triumvirate. Or Sylvie was successful in bombing the timeline and creating this multiverse. And then maybe some future Loki oh. learned of the creation of the multiverse and was like, oh, what if I team up with these two? Oh, I love the idea of somebody who was created as a result of her actions or allowed to persist as a result of her actions coming in and thanking her. <laughs> or being like, let's make it even worse. Like you two are clearly, <laughs> you two are clearly the most mischievous people ever. Let's have a trio. And then next thing you know, it's like 80 Lokis all together running around causing havoc. <laughs> <laughs> we just, they're like tribbles. They just keep, we get yes. more and more Lokis. <laughs> and by the end, it's uh, it's like a soccer stadium's worth of Lokis running around. That's Or just like pour water on a mogwai. Right? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Loki as a gremlin is probably a better comp. That is a more <laughs> accurate assessment of his mischievous personality and his nature. And we don't really see him hydrating a lot. So, you know, maybe he's, <laughs> he's similarly opposed to water. Is Loki still your favorite between these two, Christine? Or is there any chance that Sylvie is catching up to him as a favorite for you? I like her. I like her a lot. But Loki is still my fave. I mean, how could anyone else be my favorite after that scene in the train car? Okay? The Asgardian song, the the Figgy Port, Loki talking about Frigga. And of course, my favorite moment of the entire episode, the love is an imaginary dagger metaphor, which was so amazing. Uh, Like, I was totally there with Loki. I'm like, oh, my God, yes. Love is a dagger. Like, that shit is painful and beautiful and intimate, just like a dagger and all this. And then he made it imaginary. And I was like, oh, wait, what what, what, what happened? (laughs) Also, we learned that Loki has a five-second rule. He really wanted to go back for that snack after he dropped it on the floor. He's like, that's a shame for that to go to waste. And you're like, dude. Leave it. It's strange train floor. I it's mean, the uh, train. Yeah, exactly. It's a train floor. This is not like your home that you keep spotlessly clean. Oh, he that was is gross. a delightful drunk, too, which I always appreciate oh, about anyone to have in my life. I love a good drunk. Yes. But Sylvie won me over with the scream. I'm a little more in her camp now. I'm sure I will vacillate as I am wont to do between these two. But I do love to be around people who just are themselves. And it's just such a relief because you know when they're mad or they're happy or they're just chill. You're not always wondering what they're thinking. Loki, even as a character, sometimes ties me in knots because I'm always wondering what this dude is really after. Can I trust him? Will he betray people? Will he just turn into Odin at the end of the episode or the end of the movie? (laughs) You know, it's like... I'm I'm a little bit wary of Loki because he's burned me a couple times. And so Sylvie's scream is my jam because it cinched that I can trust her. And I'll always keep Loki at bay a little bit just because he's always trying to get me to trust him. And look, Sylvie's a mess, but I can count on her to be herself. And I love that. You see, I love those people in real life, but then when it comes to my entertainment, I love the character that I can't quite figure out. And here's the thing, because we've had an opportunity to be with Loki for a decade now, right? And we know that Sylvie is a Loki, I still feel like I can't trust her 100%. Like, I love the fact that you're like, with Sylvie, what you see is what you get. And I'm like, "Mm, but... 
but is it? Like there's oh. this this part of me that's just like I feel like I can't trust her a hundred percent or I can't trust what I'm seeing a hundred percent because she is a Loki. And that just might be my Loki trauma. Right? <laughs> like, it might just be that I've loved Loki for all this time and I know I can't trust that little asshole, but it's like I, I feel like I can't fully trust Sylvie either because she's a goddamn Loki. This probably comes down to that scene of the two of them walking when Sylvie goes ahead and tells him about how enchantment works. Because there's no reason for her to give in to his very modest social pressure when she's like, well, thanks for the tactical advantage, which she yeah. then almost immediately coughs up on her own. Right. That is not a Loki move, in my opinion, but maybe getting him on side is some sort of master plan for her. Now I'm going to be wondering about this for the next three weeks. Sorry. The other thing that I'm weirdly pondering a lot as I rewatch this episode is which one of them has the better, or maybe even the better way to say this is which one of them has the w worst fashion sense. I'm really torn on who's the better dresser, who's got the better sense of style. Do you have an opinion on that? Okay, so I haven't seen a lot from Sylvie. Yeah. But I still think she might have the best fashion sense. It's a low so, bar. Yeah. So, like, listen, I love Loki's look in Ragnarok, but that was probably the only time I've ever liked anything that he's been in. You know, I love her understated diadem. I think it's a much nicer look than Loki's ridiculous ass horns, right? I mean, those things are massive. You see Loki coming a mile away. There's no, <laughs> there's no mistake of who you're dealing with when he's got those ridiculous fucking ass horns on. But Sophie, to me... Even though I believe she didn't grow up in a royal court, her look to me is a bit more regal and less ridiculous. Um, but yeah, and I love the detailing work of the leather and the mixed metal like around her chest area. Um, you know, I'm like Edna Mo. I could do without the cape, so I'm glad she got rid of it yeah, at yeah. you know <laughs> in the end and got it taken away. And I love her, like, I think it's a jumpsuit. I don't know if it's two-piece or whatever, but, like, that look just looks amazing on her. So, yeah, I'm with Sylvie. I think she she looks better than the Loki does <laughs> fashion-wise. I mean, anybody who's really into that variant jacket, I have to question their style. It does come back to this damn variant jacket. Not only because Loki was enthusiastic to get it, but that when he was partying drunk, the look he went for, when he could have chosen to look like anything to these think? people, went back to that corny ass jacket. Loki, what are you doing, man? But I think it also goes back to your question from, I think it was the last episode. You know, does Loki enjoy working at the TVA? Yeah, the fuck he does. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's not letting go of that jacket at all. He could literally, literally transform into anything anything and he wore that jacket like dude come on put back on your as guardian you know fine leather that you love so much you and uh, sophie could be a matching pair why not strange choices from our man loki <sighs> but the other thing they did besides talk about trust and moms and all that they fought a lot and we've discussed the value of sylvie tying back her hair and their blades and weapons of choice. But if it came down to it, and it was you and one of them in a, in a crowded alley with a bunch of bad guys, who would you rather have in a fight? Okay, so I reserve the right to change my answer after a few more episodes with Sylvie. <laughs> but at this point of the game, ah, like, oh, I feel like an idiot for saying this, but I'm going to say Loki. For the simple reason that he's more down for a team up than Sylvie is. Oh. You know, I think Sylvie has lived the majority of her life thinking she has to do things on her own. Whereas Loki grew up with a family. And even though he said he can only count on himself, he really lives for teaming up in a fight. He really <laughs> does. So I would pick, I would pick Loki. But I, I truly do appreciate the fact that Sylvie is mission focused. Like, I feel like if she and I had to devise a plan together, 
I would trust her to execute the plan. But as folks have discussed, I think in StoryCast, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men, you know, (laughs) what's the point of making a plan? Because the shit always goes awry, right? And someone like Loki is quick to adapt in that type of situation. But you never know if you could actually trust him in that situation. So that's why I feel a bit foolish saying Loki. But at the end of episode three, that's my answer. It's a lot closer than I think people who just watch Sylvie kick ass might think that it is Loki, especially the ability to just like get on the other side of you instantly with like a little minor bit of teleportation, which I'm surprised you didn't use in the train. But I guess when you're actually getting thrown out of a train, you might not be able to have the concentration required to step back through some other space portal you've created. He definitely holds his own against her. He uses his patented get behind you and flip around and arm lock you move, which Mm -hmm. I assume he uses once on everyone and then they figure it out and he's a lot easier to beat after that. But he attacks from the shadows. He's got a bunch of distraction techniques that he can use on you. It's just that I'm worried that he would actively flip sides in the fight. He does love to turn on people. And so I do struggle with that. Sylvie also likes fighting. She got a smile on her face during that TVA assault that told me Mm -hmm. that she is not only going to stay focused on the mission, but I I can count on her to keep kicking ass because she likes it. And at the end of the day, I I, I think I do land there, even though I think Loki is the cooler and more clever answer here. Let's dig into each of them individually just for a little bit. We'll start with our main Loki. I want to check in on his moral compass. Did you see any signs? Did he show anything that suggested that this lamentous adventure in the third episode made him any better of a person? So, first of all, I'm going to say I love this question. And I think it would be a great, like, ongoing question for us, like a a periodic check-in on, like, where Loki is in his development. Um, so I, I really, really, really love this question. And I struggled with it, to be honest, because I was like, I was looking for something, but everything felt so Loki. And I'm wondering if that's a sign, you know, that this felt like the most authentic version of Loki that I've seen at any given moment in time. He didn't seem like he was putting up a front at any point. And and I absolutely enjoyed that. Um, so maybe it's a sign that he's letting down his guard and, you know, feels comfortable. You mentioned the word vulnerability. Maybe he feels he's he's able to be vulnerable with Sylvie. I just don't know if that's a Loki thing or a Loki with Sylvie thing. Oh, right. Right, right. Is he alone capable of standing with a sort of stronger moral compass? That's a fascinating distinction. When Loki is standing in that town square and he's having that realization and he says, they're going to kill all these people. Right. That felt like a breakthrough moment. This is the same Loki who a few days ago in his world, he was fine with killing this kind of person in New York City, the little Mm -hmm. guy. He had Mm -hmm. no qualms about it. Total afterthought on his path to rule Midgard. But now he stands up there. He looks around and he's just like, holy shit, these people are going to die there. And they're going to let these people die. So he's not only sad about the death. Oh, that's bad. He's assigning blame to the powers that be the kind of person he has always been or wanted to be. And I think that's progress. I love that. I love that. That's such a great point that basically this Loki was able to progress to Ragnarok Loki in just a matter of I don't know how much time he he was at the TVA at this point. Right. And we don't know if it was like days or hours, but that that moment was Loki arriving at Ragnarok with that massive ship coming to collect his people and take them away and get them out of Hela's grip, right? Like, he was able to do all of that character development <laughs> that we'd seen over years in the course of the, mat- the amount of time that he was at the TVA. It's absolutely remarkable. 
Do we want to talk about his telekinesis at all? The internet certainly has. Every website has an article about it, of some kind of thought about what's going on with this power set. Where does it come from? And all of those articles point out that he showed off this skill a bit in Dark World, but definitely not at this level. So he, you know, he moved some stuff around with his mind when he learned out that that Frigga died in Dark World. He's like, ah, and he had kind of a Sylvie moment, actually. I hadn't thought about the connection between that and her moment of blowing off steam after the train. But he pops some stuff with his mind in Dark World, but not at this level. He grabbed a giant tower, threw it right back upright and totally moved on in a split second. So I'm curious about your reaction to the power in general, but also I wonder if he couldn't have won more fights with this ability. Why didn't he use this more? He could have crushed Tony Stark like a tin can in that suit, you would think. So this this is a great question because it's it's like the one critique I have of this show. And it's why is Loki such a punk when it comes to some of these fights? Like, why was it so difficult for him to fight these humans in the Rocksmart or whatever, the Rocks cart, whatever the, the Walmart is of the future? <laughs> like, why was it so difficult for him? To fight mere mortals on Earth. Like, Sylvie has taken hold of their mind. I don't think she's taken... She doesn't enhance them, right? So I was so confused as to why it was so difficult for him to to beat these people when he fights... He fought with Thor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he has physical altercations with Thor. So... That's one thing that I've definitely been upset with with the show is that all of a sudden Loki, in several respects, is weaker than the Loki we're used to. So then when he does things that is more on the level of what we're used to with him, it's so surprising. Like, so I want to go back to that scene in Dark World when he's in his cell and they tell him that his mother is dead, it's like this spark, right? Like everything moves, but nothing explodes. But when Thor comes to see him with this bargain, right? Like you're going to help me exact revenge and then you're coming back to this cell. And Loki's talking to him. And he's like, dude, none of the tricks. Like I want to see you right now. And his room is an absolute mess. Like, <laughs> Uh, Jocelyn calls him broke boy Loki and he's totally broke boy Loki like he's dirty he's disheveled his room is an absolute mess so I think when we see that burst it's him still maintaining a glamour that he has really destroyed the shit out of that room and the way when we see broke boy Loki that's the room that he created in that moment but he doesn't let you see it So the power that he has was masked in that moment because of the glamour that he was putting on, the illusion that he was giving this really stately uh, prison cell that he was in. So I think folks haven't really been able to see just how powerful Loki is because he hides it. But then at the same time, like the, the juxtaposition of weakening Loki and then having him do powers that we know he can do is just it's just bad. It's 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 very confusing for the viewer. I think Loki using his telekinesis to put that pillar back up is Loki grade level power. I don't find that surprising at all. I find weak Loki to be surprising. And I'm pretty comfortable if they wanted to adjust his power level for the show's purpose, for the narrative purpose. I know a lot of people wouldn't be. I totally respect that. I don't have a problem if the story they want to tell requires that this Loki is just a little easier to beat in hand-to-hand combat for whatever reason. But it's the consistency that makes it hard to argue with your critique. The idea that one second he's getting beat up by guards in literal sweaters. Their armor is knitted. It's not hard for me to imagine Loki beating them up with just his fists. Forget the fact that he could just knock them all back with his mind powers or blow a hole in the train and shove them all out with his mind that he just used to set up the tower. So putting all of that in the same episode definitely frustrates me because it's hard to suspend disbelief. They just want him to be as strong as he needs to be to be in a difficult situation for that scene. 
And that makes it hard to look across those scenes and say, I have any sense of how this guy's magic worked. They did a much better job with the Enchantress's powers and explanations about difficulties of minds and so on. I wish they had done the same for Loki's strength level. Yeah, because like, even if maybe his powers are on the same level just in the nine realms, right? And then he goes to Lamentis, and then maybe, you know, he's not as powerful. But at the same but at the same time, in that episode, don't remind us that he's a god. Yeah. Like Loki says, I'm a god in this episode, and then gets thrown off a train by guards. In Give sweaters. me a break. In in turtlenecks, not just sweaters and fucking turtlenecks. <laughs> Which is like, I I just can't. I can't square that vision of Loki with the same Loki that assaulted New York City with the Chitauri. Yeah, it's a tough one to explain. I have a theory on the telekinesis that is classic Mark overthinking it. But can I tell you my theory? Please, because I have one that's not my own that Mm. I'm hoping we could talk about too. Go for it. Great. I'll I'll give you mine then. I want to hear that for sure. I wonder if his telekinesis is tied to how much of himself he's holding back. Mm. He does the smash up in Dark World when he's feeling raw and real about Frigga's death. He has no agenda. He is just totally in those feels. And I wonder if in a rush to survive with Sylvie, if Loki's telekinesis is literally a reflection of his clarity of purpose, his clarity of self. Maybe a clear mind, a clear Loki mind can move mountains. That's my take on the telekinesis. I love that. I absolutely love that. I actually connected a little bit more to your theory when you were talking more about his feelings and opening up. So not necessarily like the clarity of mind, but being more in tune with his emotions and his internal self. So I keep thinking about the show The Magicians when I watch this TV series, and it's been a minute since I watched it, and I binged it one time. So like, it's not super fresh in my mind. So forgive me if I'm mischaracterizing anything. But one thing I do remember about the show is them talking about magic being about emotions and like, you know, connecting to your magic that way. Um, And so I think Loki being vulnerable and being more open could make him a more powerful magician. So, oh, I love that. I love that theory. That self-realization is power and powerful. Well, I love your tweet tweak to make it more about in touch with his feelings than a clarity of purpose. And it just fits his character growth, I think, if that's something that's there. It's probably not what they're thinking. I just thought it was a nice way to make some headcanon out of this Yeah, difference. I love that. That's my headcanon now. So what's the theory you were talking about? So I was on the internet recently, as you do. Why would you do that to yourself? That's just, I know. I mean, just... It's such a hellscape sometimes, but you know. You can find this show on the internet, so it's got some good stuff too. www.marvelousTVclub.com <laughs> So I... Uh, <laughs> I I can't I, was it maybe Screen Crush I think um I can't remember and I'm so sorry I can't credit this theory to whoever said it I think it was Screen Crush but they said what if Loki took a time stone from the drawer cuz I think it was the one piece that he actually did pick up and put it in his pocket and forgot about it <laughs> and because he's such a powerful magician, in that moment, reverse time and kind of put reverse the pillar back up. You know, in a show that's all about timey wiminess, I was like, ah, oh, you know, why mm-hmm. not? You know, and the time stone is lost on Earth now. So, like, maybe this is a way of keeping the time stone in play for Doctor Strange. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is kind of a fun theory. And then when I rewatched it, it didn't look as though he just like tossed it back. It really did look as though it was like reincorporated back into the building. Mm-hmm. So I so I was like, I kind of understand where this theory is coming from because I think with the telekinesis, you just like 
you just toss it back or you have it floating back so that it doesn't harm you, um, you don't necessarily merge it back into the building, right? That seems more of like a time thing. Yeah, part of me says it was a cheaper effect to basically hit rewind on the tape and have it spin back up. And they're just like, well, that's good enough. I love the forgotten <laughs> stone part of this, though. It's really fun to imagine that he did it. But he's so certain he's like, I've got this and he catches it that yeah. he either has to know that he's got something on him or it's something else because he expected to catch and throw it back. But it is weird that it does look like it reforms. I definitely agree yeah. with that. Can I just say one quick thing that's so random, but I really appreciate Tom Hiddleston's expression of Loki's power, his little like chest thrust that he does. Like he can't do that and me not laugh. Like when he's when he's on trial at the TVA and he, he does that little peck thrust to try to use his powers. I die every time I fucking see it, like, without fail. That joke has such good staying power. So, like, when he did that with the pillar, I couldn't help but laugh a little bit. Because I was just like, oh, look at him exerting his little power. And, of course, I'm sitting here doing it myself over and over again because it just delights me so much. And now I'm crying. I'm laughing so hard. Yeah, there's a camp quality to it. I, I can't tell how much he's in on the joke. I think pretty much by based on that scene at the TVA. But there's definitely a camp quality to Loki doing his peck thrust to put the telekinesis into effect. Oh, it's so good. Well, enough about that, Loki. Let's talk about the other Loki, the Sylvie. I want to talk about her backstory just a bit because Christine, she said she knew she was adopted, that she was told that she was adopted, and yet she barely remembers her mother. Blips of a dream at this point, I believe is what she said. What gives? How can, how can both of those things be true? She remembers enough to have this whole backstory that's totally different than Loki, and yet barely remembers her mother. What's going on there? So... Remember, I asked you and Jesse, how on earth could the TVA allow a grown up female Loki? It's such a strong variation of the Loki that we know that to me, it never made any sense as to how the TVA could allow her to grow up. So I feel like and, and bless you both for for attempting to answer the question on a previous PonderVision episode, the answers didn't satisfy me. So yeah, I've been enough. like still, I and you know, I love you guys and I live for PonderVision, but like it's like, I was just like, this is, this is still bothering me. So when she said that she was adopted and she like has known forever that she was adopted or she's known for a long time that she was adopted, I was like, oh, the TVA adopted her. They nabbed her when she was young. Because there's no way I see the TVA allowing Sylvie Laufey's daughter to grow up. It's just too massive of a variation. So I think they nabbed her when she was young and probably raised her. Like, I don't know if they did the mind wipe on her mm -hmm. or like let her grow up to a certain point and then like did the TVA magic on her. So like she's been able to exist for all these hundreds of years or I mean but she might be able to exist for hundreds of years on her own our Loki is a thousand years old right so maybe that's not a thing I'm still trying to work all of this out but I think she didn't grow up in a royal court she right. grew up at the TVA where she learned to cuss and she says things like when, when she called him a variant it sounded like a slur Oh, like if the TVA were saying it. Yes. And the fact that she's so mission focused, unlike Loki. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's something that the TVA taught her. Maybe she was used like all the other TVA staff in that she's a Loki. We've got all these variant Lokis. She could be the first Loki to help catch a Loki. You know, and in studying all of these variant Lokis and seeing how fucking annoying they are, she's like, don't fucking call me a Loki. 
These people mm-hmm. are stupid and disgusting, and I've had to study them my entire life, you know. And she sees Loki. She sees all of these Lokis growing up with probably Odin and Frigga and having a sense of longing for that type of childhood or that type of upbringing that she was robbed of because the TVA stole her away because she's a variant. So, you know, when she talks about her mother as blips of a dream, when you think of blips, like maybe all that she knows of her mother these days are the recordings of the Loki stories that she's had to watch over Ooh. and over the tapes, you know, or the moments that she had with her mother because they were from her childhood when she was really small, you know, she could barely remember them. But but the blips, I kind of think of blips on a TV screen, you know, yeah. that she's had, she's only ever really spent time with her mother because she spent time with them in the time theater, watching them on a screen. And it's so fucking sad. But then you understand, like, the animus behind the word variant and not being called a Loki and being so different from Loki, from our Loki, going through that long ass list of differences. And then it's like, okay, we're going to spend five minutes on their similarities because they were raised entirely different. I love when we have similar ideas that branch out into different outcomes. So I was also with you that she had to be taken when she was young for this to make any sense. You imagine her as becoming a ward of the state. And there actually is considerable evidence of that, that the TVA just takes her. I had just imagined her more as a runaway, always trying to get away, that essentially they Mm -hmm. grabbed her to erase her. She skips town. But the evidence for your theory is pretty strong not least because they, she knows a lot about how the TVA works. I hadn't considered right. the idea that of the slur-like use of variant. But also going back to that scene where she talks about being adopted, Loki says, what, they told you? And Sylvie says, yeah, did they not tell you? And they might be meaning different they's there. Right. That mm-hmm. in your theory, the TVA is the they. Yeah, they told me I was adopted. And even through potentially these blips on the TV that you're talking about, that they watched a different Loki get told by Frigga Mm -hmm. that he's adopted is how she learned she was adopted. The TVA told her that she was adopted. So there's a lot of evidence there. The only reason I thought about the runaway thing was just because she's learned so much for so long about how to survive in this space. But both could be Mm -hmm. true because if she spent you know, her childhood growing up with the TVA and then hundreds or thousands of years of working for them, her mom's a distant memory in either scenario just because this has been going on for a while for her. She has to be much older than our Loki, which is why I think the mom memory is gone. But she could easily have been their ward before going on the run. I love it. No, but but to, to your point, You know, she does say, I spent my entire life running from the TVA. So maybe she wasn't raised by them, you know, but there is there is the knowing so much about how the TVA works that just I keep coming back to. I'm like, oh, but maybe not your entire life. Maybe it just feels like your entire life. (laughs) Yeah, maybe it's just your adult life. Your adult life has been on the run or something. I can't wait to get the answer to this. We might get it as soon as next episode. That just thrills me to no end. Yeah. Speaking of, we have three of them to go, Christine. Do you hope, do you think Sylvie makes it to the end of the series alive? I really hope so. I enjoy her as a character. I want to know more about her. You know, we just talked, we just gave her a backstory (laughs) that, you know, we're both desperate to see whether or not it plays out or just like to learn what it is. So... I'm I'm enjoying her by herself. Now, I'm going to say something that is probably the product of, you know, Hollywood, the movie industry, the TV industry, always using women as a means to help grow other people's characters. But I keep coming back to this line that Mobius says... Uh, about Loki's 
and he said, you know, you weren't born to be King Loki. You were born to cause pain and suffering and death. That's how it is. That's how it was. That's how it will be. All so others can achieve their best versions of themselves. And remember last week, we were t- we were like, what is it going to be like for two Lokis to like be together? Like, what kind of dynamic is that going to be? And now I'm just like, oh, my God, are they going to help each other achieve their best versions of themselves? Is that what they're going to do together? What they've done in the past is like help elevate other people, you know, Loki brought the Avengers together and Loki helped Thor go on his path of growth as well. But now if that's a Loki's purpose, if that's what a Loki does, maybe that's what they'll do for each other. So I'm like, oh, Sylvie, (laughs) you're going to help my Loki and Loki, you're going to help my Sylvie and this is going to be great. So I want them to help each other grow and be better and achieve the best versions of themselves. They have to get off this fucking rock. They have to do it. I admire your optimism, Christine. That's a very sweet and charming ending. I would also love to see that. I think we're going to split the difference with Sylvie in the end, though. This Sylvie is pretty hard to imagine running around in the MCU for me after this show. She's very powerful. She's super independent and strong-willed. And even Loki himself, this Loki, hard to imagine him being a free agent where he can't run around and interact with our characters. So I'm pretty skeptical about one or both of them making it out. But I like one tweak on our idea, our mutually agreed upon idea that young Sylvie gets taken by the TVA, which is that they might save young Sylvie, who could be part of our Young Avengers crew that will certainly be assembled down the line and give her a chance at a better life. That's sweet. But not as sweet as the two of them actually just becoming good and happy people who can live contentedly and not be pieces of shit, you know? Oh, I mean, not be pieces of shit. I feel like it's moving things a little too far. Like, I still want them to be mischievous. And mischievous, that's Get into true. all types of hijinks and cause problems for people, but still be good people at their core. You right. know what Chaotic I mean? good in the D&D yes, language. We've talked about the D&D language good. before. Lawful evil versus chaotic good. And the idea of, like, what are you, what's your and value but also the way in which you get it so they get it by chaos and and i think that's yeah that is a very charming and certainly very cinematic way to be i would watch a sylvie solo show in a heartbeat sophia di martino has charmed me to no end so but you're killing her i am i'm a ruthless son of a bitch this is why i'm not in charge of the marvel <laughs> universe they'd all be dead everyone would be like where are all our characters i'd be like well they had a a heart-rending and devastating and tragic end of their movie, and that's why no one came to the theater and I'm out of a job. (laughs) So is she getting pruned? Like, how is your Sophie meeting her end? I'm still stuck on the thing that we saw in the trailer that we haven't seen yet from Lamentis, which is the two of them in the back just sitting on that rock together. Could have been a throwaway shot they didn't use from the scene we did get of the two of them sitting on this rock in this episode. But it felt to me like the place where these two Lokis who have no home might go to be together... Because they have accepted that whatever the TVA's lies might be, that their variations for some reason are not allowed to go on or that it would be a terrible thing for them to continue on. I I would need some justification for that before I would sit my ass on a rock and let myself go. But I thought that maybe there's a chance that the two of them decide to go out together. But maybe that's what we'll get at the beginning of this episode. It's probably more likely they return to that rock and are sitting there and ready to go. And Mobius or Loki or some other Loki or Frigga or Steve Rogers comes and saves them. All right. So it's time to turn our attention away from the Lokis for a change. As much as that would upset them, I want to talk about somebody (laughs) else for a bit. I want to talk about Mobius Because he's not in this episode, but we got confirmation of your amazing theory that you had downright in basically every detail. He's a variant. They've been wiping his mind, but the details are still in there somewhere, which is how Sylvie got C20 to cough up the goods. Mobius surely is going to be told in our next episode about this reality, about this truth about him. How do you think he's going to react? 
Well, listen, you and I have discussed on multiple episodes now that Mobius is a company man. <laughs> like, he he believes in the TVA. Like, I, I'm still on the fence as to whether or not he believes, like, religiously in the timekeepers, but he does believe in the TVA and its great purpose, and he thinks it's the center of the fucking universe and all of that. So... Mobius is going to take a lot of convincing, like tie him down in a chair and tape his eyeballs open type of convincing. I think the only way they're going to be able to do it is to show him his life. Like they're going to have to find his reel in the time theater and be like, dude, Look at you on a jet ski. <laughs> like, this was your <laughs> life. And I don't know how they're going to be able to do that. Like, I, Sophie's somehow going to have to be able to do it or mm -hmm. do her enchantment trick. I mean, the thing is, I don't know if Mobius would believe it unless he's well aware of Sophie's background and her story and her capabilities, right? But say you have to do the time theater thing and, you know, somehow I don't, the whole TVA is fucking chasing you, how you're going <laughs> to be able to do this. But, like, how do you even find Mobius's strip? Because his name probably isn't even Mobius. Probably not. Just like her name wasn't C20 when she was hanging out in that bar wherever right. they were. I don't know. It's going to be difficult, but he's going to need a lot a lot of convincing because he's not going to believe it. You laid out, I think, the three steps of this process, though. They're going to tell him when he shows up. He's not going to believe them. She's going to show him in her mind or his mind. He's not going to believe them. So they're going to take his ass to 1991 or whatever, and he will mm. see himself on that jet ski drinking that Josta and finally be reeling from that reality. Right. And while I don't love the description of him as a company man, it's a fucking fact, Christy, and he is a company man. So I think he'll run to Renslayer and tell her of this travesty. You won't believe what they're doing to us, Ravona. And she'll be like, motherfucker, I'm the one in charge of this program. Right. Like, I'm the one who did this to you. Right. And that's when the bloom will be off the rose for him fully for the TVA. We've talked about the apartment on StoryCast, the 1959-1960 movie with Jack Lemmon, and it's a great romantic comedy, but it's also about a guy who goes into this enthusiastic big company situation ready to be Mr. Can-Do-It-All for the good of the bottom line, and by the end of it, super jaded and not into it, and it does feel like another touch point for Mobius will be when he makes that switch, but it's going to be Renslayer who breaks his heart you know, I mean, she's going to be like, you brought me that snow globe before you figured it out last time and I had to wipe your mind or whatever. And it's just, it's going to be sad. He's going to be pissed off. He's going to be hurt. And then I think he's going to want to get even. And I'm just like, uh, is she going to wipe his mind or is she just going to get rid of him? Okay, well, that leads me to my next question for you about Mobius. Do you think there's only one Mobius running around and she's maybe wiping him if he figures out too much or gets too smart? Or do you think there's a bunch of Mobiuses running around and she's putting them all to work and they're totally ignorant of each other? I mean, I hadn't considered the mind wipe. So I was just like, yeah, of course there's more than one Mobius, you know, because he acted as though he didn't remember, you know, leaving so many rings on Renslayer's end table. Um, you know, and we've got two Lokis in this show. We Why do. not? <laughs> Why not two Mobiuses or more? But now, now that we know that the TVA is mind wiping these folks, yeah, why not just keep mind wiping, you know, these these loyal workers? Because it's like it's like the good place. Just hit the reset button every time yeah. they find out that they're <laughs> actually in the bad place. You know, Mark, there's something I've been itching to bring up to you and uh, you know, ever since I saw this episode, and I don't, I don't know how to exactly fit it into our little outline here, but I think, I think now might be a good time. So, remember the cold open to this entire show. Well, you know, Loki takes the Tesseract, goes into the Gobi Desert. They bring him to the TVA. 
you know, and he goes through all of this processing. The last scene of the cold open is the take a ticket scene. And I think the ticket is a test. Will you blindly follow direction? If you take a ticket, there's a chance you'll end up working for the TVA because you will just blindly listen to what it is that they ask you to do or tell you to do. But douchebags like homeboy whose dad was on the board of Goldman Sachs, who's like, no, I'm going to do things my way. Fuck you guys and fuck your orders and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm going to be a douche over here. They're like, yeah, fuck it. We're not even going to bother with a trial for you. You're just going to get eradicated right here. You've lost your shot at working for the TVA. Brilliant. Absolutely. And it builds on my theory about the Kabuki theater of Mobius quote unquote, intervening on behalf of Loki to save him and start to build loyalty in a scene that they might have played out a bunch of times. But the idea that you only get there because you took the ticket so we know you're pliable is right. next level shit. That is spectacular. I have, go- I have goosebumps. I like it when Christine theorizes and I, I'm like, I feel like it's like a good divining rod because that's exactly how I felt when you were talking about your variant theory and it all adds up. And so if you know that someone will take the ticket, then you know you're onto the type of person you could use. I'm still on the fence, though, about whether there's there's multiple Mobiuses. Because, yeah, you could wipe this guy's mind, but we know that fragments get left. Why run the risk of a well-worn Mobius continually iterating on his experience when you could just pluck another Mobius or wait for him to break the timeline again because we've seen that people might be inclined to do this over and over You just prune the old, grab the new, make sure he takes a ticket. And if he doesn't ditch him, you have a very efficient way of determining whether the variant you know that already can work is one of the ones that will. Yeah. I mean, my only thing is, do you want to, oh, but but time works differently over. Okay. What I'm going to say is, do you want to invest time having to retrain someone? You know, but of course, time runs differently over there. I guess they've got infinite buckets of it. So maybe the reinvestment in retraining someone isn't that big of a deal. But, you know, my linear ass is like, oh, but do do I want to have to retrain somebody? Why not have somebody who has like a tinge of memory of this, a little bit of muscle memory even, you know, in doing the job? Let's just wipe them clean and deal with this body as opposed to going through the whole process of getting another variant of this person. Because it seems like Mobius does a good job at his job. So I think they'd want to keep him around because he's good at it. But, you know, maybe another variant would be just as good. I don't know. Maybe they can even compartmentalize his training and leave that there and then just clear out the rest. And then right. you really get efficient. I think I'm compelled by that training argument. Just out of curiosity, though, which one would you be more offended by if you were Mobius or you yourself turned out to be in the situation? Would you be more mad that they kept killing you when you found out or did something and grabbing another Christine or that they've been wiping your mind and you're the same, Christine, but this Renslayer, for example, has been having the same conversation with you over and over again. I mean, I'd probably be more mad at the former because then I'd be terrified, like, as this conversation is happening, I'm about to be fucking killed. (laughs) So, like, probably the former because at least with the second, I have hope that, you know, my mind will be wiped and maybe I'll get to this point again. Um, and that's just my vicious time loop prison that I'm in that I'm just fated to like come to this point one more time and have my mind wiped. But I feel like that's a better existence than no existence, right? Okay, that's hard to argue with. I was thinking it would suck to get personally betrayed by the same person over and over again. But it's actually worse to just get killed by that person over and over again. Way scarier, way scarier. See, I've learned my audience. This is this is going back to the, is it better to be tortured by the devil or like better to just be wiped from existence when we were talking about WandaVision? I'm impressed that you have that much of a recollection back to the WandaVision days. This show, it's hard for me to remember what I said two weeks ago. So look at you with the eidetic memory. That's impressive. 
It's because I like being right. Oh, well, that's, that's, <laughs> it's a good like quality Loki. to have to be when you know. It also helps to have such good theories that turn out to be true. That would be a good reason to remember your shit too. Let's talk about the last piece of the TVA that I want to get into this week, and that is those mysterious timekeepers, the mm. keepers of the sacred timeline. On PonderVision, Jesse raised the possibility of Frigga being a variant who is in charge of the TVA. And I know you've watched a lot of the Thor movies. You've got affection for Dark World. So I have to know, as as a fan of these things, as a, as a deep studier of these characters, how would you feel if that were true? I mean, honestly, Jesse broke my heart with this theory. It would really hurt my heart if it was a Frigga variant in charge of the TVA, because this doesn't seem to be in Frigga's nature at all. You know what I mean? Like, she loved Loki. You want to talk about investing time in someone and building them up. Like, Loki was... Frigg is the star in his sky, like the sun in his sky. Like everything revolved around Frigga. Frigga trained him to be the the magician that he is. And when he learned of her death, you saw the pain and devastation on Broke Boy Loki's face. Like that wasn't the reaction he had to Odin dying. You know, like you you don't play favorites or you're not supposed to, but there's always that one parent you might love just a little bit more <laughs> than the <laughs> other. And Frigga was definitely the parent that he loved more than anyone. So for Frigga to be the person that says the timeline that is sacred is going to be the one where Loki is this kind of fuck up all the time. And when he finally becomes a decent person is when he dies. I think that's absolutely horrendous. It would be such a betrayal to Loki and to the person that Frigga was for him. You know, and maybe I could understand the theory a little bit better if it was Frigga's death that was the turning point for mm -hmm. Loki's character development because at mm -hmm. least that centers her a little bit in her, you know, love for her beloved son. But it's not. It's Thor finally telling Loki that he's done with him and he wishes him well and gets the one up on him. So Loki's like, well, shit, I can't fool him anymore. And he kind of says this really affectionate thing to me about like thinking that we were going to, you know, live out our lives together and always be together. But you know, I've kind of fucked that whole idea up and it hurts my feelings, but okay, well, fine then. I'll just go and betray you. And then it's like, oh, but I can't because you've learned all my goddamn tricks. God <laughs> damn it. So, so that's the turning point for Loki. So I don't see Frigga choosing that that's the way things are supposed to be for her beloved son. Like it would, it would literally hurt my feelings <laughs> if this was true. Initially, that was my read as well. The more I have sat with it, though, I'll just say this, because it might be something that make you feel better if this came out to be true, which is if there is a way that a variant form of Frigga could become this rotten and corrupted, it might be a way to show us how much a Loki can become trustworthy and good. So there's a way to say, hey, if she's this something happened or some some there's some reason this Frigga survived and became a variant just by nature of surviving what we saw happen mm -hmm. in Dark World. And mm -hmm. then things go dark and she's put through the ringer and she just becomes a different person who's obsessed with either protecting her kid or making sure that the timeline doesn't ever change any of that. It would be a commentary on the po possibilities in a good way for Loki. But of course, I suspect that Marvel will not introduce a brand new character. Not that we haven't seen Frigga, but only in those flashbacks. So I would be surprised. It, it would blow people's minds, though, if Rene Russo was at the top of that. Yeah, no kidding. And their budget, but... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, they're printing money these days. So who do you mm -hmm. hope is behind those gold doors when they open on whatever floor the timekeepers are on? For me, it has to be either Loki or an empty room. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I wrote Loki or no one, and then I was like, oh, that kind of sounds like it's got to be Loki and only Loki. But no, like, it, it. I wanted to be a Loki or 
there's nobody there or it's, you know, Renslayer is really the person in charge of everything. And the whole idea of the timekeepers is absolute bullshit because I can't really think of anyone else that either would make sense or would be satisfying at the end of the day. Exactly. That's the piece to come back to. Theories that range out into the wider MCU as a whole, if you think of the MCU as an ongoing story project, there are ways to talk yourself into lots of possibilities. You know, a middle-aged Steve Rogers who lost his Peggy and after going back in time and kept trying to fix it and fix it and couldn't and just became more and more vicious and obsessed with the sacred timeline and all that stuff. You could come up with all these stories, but it wouldn't allow you to watch this story and have it hold together. And that's what Marvel is trying to do with these TV shows, which is the right way to do it because they need to feel like complete stories. Once everything just becomes a commentary on everything else, we've lost the thread. Perfect. So then who would be the worst answer if we're talking about these things? If Who would be the answer that would cause these problems? So I've got two answers for you. For me, the least satisfying is something we've already alluded to, and that's some new character that we've never met. It just makes them this type of MacGuffin, and I'm just like, ugh. I would be so annoyed if it was someone new that... As a non-comic book reader, I knew absolutely nothing about. Like, there's a lot out there in the ether about King the Conqueror. I don't know shit about King the Conqueror other than he's going to be a character in the Multiverse of Madness. If it ends up being Kang behind those doors, like, I'm going to be pissed. Like, who the fuck is this guy? What does he have to do with this story? I will be super annoyed. But I have another answer for you. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's the who would be the most fucked up answer. Oh. And for me, can you imagine how Loki would feel if he went through that golden elevator and on the other side was Odin? Just like bad dad taken to yet another level? Dude, I mean, talk about daddy issues for the rest of your fucking life just as you'd like come to some peace and you're like um my dad loved me you know after all and i didn't have to worry about that now i can just let that go and like be this tva person or whatever just running through time trying to figure shit out now that i'm the only person that's actually free because you know i'm not beholden to any sacred timeline but then you you find out That your entire existence is meant to be one where you're not born to be king. You're born to cause pain and suffering and death. And the whole point of you is so that others can achieve their best versions of themselves. And it was your fucking father that decreed it. Yeah. It'd be awful, wouldn't it? I'm just thinking about like what would be the most fucked up from Loki's perspective, from our titular character's perspective. And I'm just like, if Odin was behind those doors, like, I feel like it would be, I've, I've, listen, I've dismissed the Frigga theory. I'm sorry, Jesse, I love you. You know, I love you. But I, like, I've dismissed the Frigga theory. So I'm just like, that's, there's no way. But like, if Odin was behind those doors, fucking hell. That beats the shit out of my answer of just old Wanda as like a rough answer. <laughs> this would be way more fucked up. And I like it better in some ways just because it would be devastating for Loki to see that. But but Odin has disappointed us at every turn. So, I mean, it's also kind of par for the course. I'm going to, thanks for giving me that to think about for the rest of the day. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that feels like the perfect super dysfunctional place to leave our conversation, (laughs) Christine. If folks want to talk about bad dads and daddy issues with you, where can they find and follow you? Oh, you can find this daddy's girl at Kippens K on Twitter and Instagram. And you can always catch me and my friend Jocelyn discussing all types of shenanigans over at the I'm a Need More Wine podcast. All right, legendary listeners, that is the show for today. It's my birthday. And please don't use that information Woo-hoo! to steal my identity. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just realized talking about that could be unwise. Too late. It's on the Internet. And as we've learned, that's a hellscape. He was born in 1963, you guys. 1963 is the birth year. 
I'm actually from the TVA. I just, who knows how old I am. I, I was around uh, the first time we invented the sacred timeline and then I forgot it because they keep mind wiping me. So be careful about using that date because for all you know, I actually am as old as the sacred timeline itself. But look, Loki episode four is just two days away. We'll be back with StoryCast on Thursday. We've got Ponder Vision on Saturday, another character cast on Monday. I cannot wait to figure out how they get saved, what the hell Mobius has been up to, how screwed all these timelines are, and just how full of shit the TVA is in general. In the meantime, as we wait, please feel free to leave us a five-star review. We've got over 40 of them now, and they really make a difference. Folks have been reaching out to us on the website more. Feel free to hit us up there. Drop us a line. Let us know your thoughts. We've talked about a couple of them this week. I just want to thank Kristen and Steve for also talking to me and having such nice things to say about the podcast. Really keeps us all going when you do that. So thank you. And there's merch on the site if you like the Loki logo and want something with that. We've just talked about some other t-shirt ideas we might have for next week. So stay tuned for that. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Folletti. That's Mark with a C. And until then, Christine, I'm just going to go doing some angry magic to get my feels out of the way. Aw, you go be a cancer, sweetie. <laughs>